Hey, welcome back to Armchair Architects, where we're in the middle of a discussion about the dangers of AI. And I had so many questions. Let me roll back my questions and you can hear how the Armchair Architects answer them. We have a lot of large subjects now queued up, right? There's the black box nature of this stuff, right? That's it. That says, you know, like, congratulations, we're now out of the world of determinism. And like, you know, we put this thing out, we expect that out, we know how that's going to work. We know it's that we have that side of things. We have the question and then there's the black box nature of the actual model itself, right? I don't really know how that, you know, somebody, lots of smart people put this thing together. There's a big chunk of code. I hope it works the way it's supposed to. You know, you have to have some value of trust for that. Um, that's existed in large systems before as well. When people buy something, you know, you have the same deal. Did your partner write the right thing? You know, so there's that part. There is the part about um, uh, what data you show to it. Right and 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 how how confidential is that data and how do you make sure? And then there is also the part that we were getting to now, which is like how do you verify or or put something in front of the actual congratulations? I put the thing. I know what I asked. Uh, you know, I I don't exactly know what I'm asking. You know, I don't actually know the thing that, that I'm talking to because I don't see previous statement. Um, so I'm, I, I want to have some guardrails on what I'm going to get back that I might give to somebody else. You mm -hmm. know, what it, what it muses on in its spare time doesn't matter to me. It's what I hand back to my customer customers. Um, so I, I think we can take any one of these directions, Eric, why don't you pick one of them, just one of them and, and let's yeah. go in that direction. I'll do my best to stay to one of them, but I, I think what I hear our listeners probably crying out for right now is like, wow, Uli said a bunch of stuff and it sounds awesome. How do I actually practically do those things? Like if I actually have to sit down and go back to my desk and after I watch this video, where do I start? Um, so for me, actually having experience in this space um, over the past couple of years, the way that we addressed it were focusing on model reporting analytics, uh, investigating visualization and explanation tools, and then um, aggressively engaging in um, studied user interaction and feedback. And then all the while with an underpinning of those ethical considerations that Uli was talking about. So like if I think about the model reporting analytics, first is documentation, clearly documenting the model architecture. You might not be able to dive into the layers, but also focusing on the training data and sources, uh, understanding the dimensionality, the cardinality uh, of that data, what you're obfuscating and tokenizing, what you're removing from that data set, what biases might exist in that underlying training data. It'll definitely help developers understand how the model works and to potentially preempt any particular issues even before you begin the foundational model development process or the fine tuning process. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Willie, you got a question? What you're describing is awesome if you're in a traditional model world. We're not. Large language well, models are not traditional models. You don't control the data set that OpenAI uses, that Gemini uses, that Anthropic uses. You don't even know what they're training on. That's so, a good point. For, for most of the folks that are, might be in the financial services industry, there's a combination of approaches that we're, we're taking. The, the approaches are consumption of foundational models from your hugging face or subscri subscribing to cloud-based models and a hosted foundational model exercise. There's also ones in which based on proprietary information and data sets that these organizations have, we're going to create our own foundational model. In the circumstances in which you actually are curating and creating a data platform and utilizing your own foundational model, uh, absolutely you have purview and visibility to all of the recommendations and um, no, sorry, not recommendations, but the dimensionality of the data that you're going to feed your LLM to create your own hosted version. So in this particular circumstance, training data sources uh, helps you get that visibility. And that includes to me, if I'm downloading a, a LLM and utilizing it from GitHub, I also want to start asking myself like, yeah, how much documentation is associated with that foundational model? And how do I know how it was made and trained? Just because we might not, the, the, the owners or the creators of that LLM might not provide that at great detail, doesn't mean that we shouldn't be asking ourselves those questions before we just start utilizing it. That's a very fair point. Um, so 
I don't know if you want to start a new topic on this one because there is a very large conversation going on between should I build my own foundation models and uh, what's the re return on investment on that uh, capability? Oh. By, by the way, Uli, I just, yeah, I just want to jump in on that point. Never in my career have I seen such a rapid commoditization of a uh, computing workload as I have seen with generative AI. So I think that any organization needs to ask themselves, why would I create my own foundational model? Why would I accrue a data platform and, and just you know, petabytes of, of, uh, of training data and then try to create my own custom infrastructure and build my own spines and host this giant model in my own infrastructure because the hyperscalers have yet to come up with their own concrete version of a, a custom LLM hosting environment. Um, so why would I do all of that versus just subscribe to one that exists out there that I can configure and utilize and my data transmission to those things are secure, that they're not gonna be used to train, that I don't have to worry about betraying trade secrets in prompt interactions. So I think that those are all, I'm, I'm definitely there for that discussion. Like commoditization is happening by the second. Let's focus on that first and then do things that are unique second. I'm gonna call host privileges and suggest that we kick that to another another episode. And I'm more than happy to go in that direction about this. I wanted to, to so, well, he's pointing out it's a really good, this is a really fun conversation that says, you know, people really want to have control and knowledge of what's going on. And Uli's trying to say that sometimes, sorry, that is that that's the new world we live in is making that very difficult. So, but let's continue on the previous path and then we'll come back to that part as well, yeah. you know, as, as part of this. Yeah. So there still are things we can do. So let's assume that it is a black box, right? So user interaction and feedback uh, are super important. So as you engage in prompt tuning, you wanna see if you can develop confidence scores and human in the loop systems that allow you to say, well, if I ask this thing, these sets of questions, or I provide these prompts as I'm prompt tuning it, how do I understand what the scope and spectrum of the model's outputs are? How can I root out prior to going to production based on prompts that people are asking or maybe unexpected prompts that people are asking how can I not be or minimize my surprise as to a model's particular outputs, either in terms of its veracity and accuracy, whether or not it's doing hallucination, whether or not it's actually doing what you asked, or if it's just giving up too early in the process. These are all things that you're going to want to try to root out through aggressive interaction and feedback mechanisms prior to actually putting this thing in your app or releasing it to the world. Uh, and then finally, for me, there's ethical, the, the underpinning ethical considerations, which is, again, as Uli mentioned earlier, if you're in a foundational model world, you don't know what the data sets are. Um, you, they can tell you, you can believe them, um, or they might not even tell you. Um, but the idea here is through that exploration, that prompt tuning and the, the very, very specific and stringent study of interactions, how can you root out bias and mitigate it? How can you make sure that it's being respective of governance and privacy uh, implementation considerations for your particular vertical? Uh, and then when it goes wrong, how can you take accountability for that? How can you um, understand the prompts and kind of even create your own kind of catalog of what the types of the spectrum of responses are? Uh, and then certainly there's, we can go deeper into this, which I don't think we have probably have time for, but like if you're in right. retrieval augmented generation, how can, how can RAG synergistically provide quality gates during the prompt and response process? It, it's a little tricky because some of this feels very responsive. I feel like it, it's like feel like we should play this this um, drinking game in which I say to the best of your ability after every statement you make. Um, yes, right. It just it just it just feels like that's the that's the. It's not quite um, as bad, David. It's not quite really it, really. So you so you bad. yeah okay go ahead. So, so, so make me feel better, really. Like. Um, let's stick with the. Um, foundational model as a service capabilities that the hyperscalers are providing. And Eric, the hyperscalers are providing capabilities to host your own model. So I think we should talk a little bit more about that eventually. But um, let's focus on the closed models like OpenAI, Gemini, and so forth. Let's just do that for a second. Sure. Uh, they obviously are just LLMs that provide you with answers depending on what you ask them, uh, RAG or other patterns uh, using. Now, there are complementary services that at least um, companies like Microsoft have built, uh, which are what's called content safety. And so they effectively um, 
allow you to take your prompt, feed it into actually another LLM to go and go through the prompt and see if there's anything offensive, anything bad in that prompt. And also things like jailbreak, uh, where you try to trick the model into doing something that you don't want it to do. Right. Um, and that content safety capability is a service for Microsoft. I'm sure there are other capabilities out there that you can utilize to effectively safeguard your prompt input and your output. Um, where when you are using Azure OpenAI, it's actually built in. You actually can't avoid it. It go, The prompt coming in is being filtered and the result coming out is being reviewed and filtered according to policy. And the policies are being set up <coughs> by you. There's a default set of policies, but you can tune them based upon your requirements and how you think about it. And these content safety capabilities utilize the entire um, learning from responsible AI journeys, because this is not new. This is something we've been doing for a while as an industry and are incorporating that capability set into a yeah, single service that effectively goes filters bias, filters all that stuff based upon what you know. And again, the goal is to not go and say, I know exactly how this thing got trained. I know exactly and control what it got fed. There are certain areas where you just can't. So you now focus on what you can control, which is the input and the output into the system. And I think that's a different philosophy uh, for responsible AI uh, than we had before. Where it was like, here's the thing. Um, I get the fence that you're going to say at some point, Eric, that's awesome. And also verify, um, you know, and also do, as you suggested, uh, an active, an active process whereby you know, you feel really good about this because I don't think we have, we also don't necessarily have industry-wide ways of, of specifying this policy. Like the, like click here if you don't want racist things, you know, like is, is, is you know, not, I don't think is quite there yet. And um, I think that we should probably, this is a big topic. And I think what we're going to want to probably do is, is chop this thing up a little bit more and, and talk a little bit about more of this in future episodes. So why don't we leave it right here with these three big things going on? Um, I was really psyched to hear us start to argue again because it means we're getting really into some really good material. So that's super fun. Um, I just want to thank all the, the two of you, and I want to thank everybody who's watching us here on the Azure Enablement Show. Look forward to seeing you next time. Mm -hmm.